Great. So happy Wednesday, everybody. My name is Caitlin Thaney. I'm the Executive Director of Invest in Open Infrastructure. Um, for those who might be new to IOI, we're a nonprofit initiative dedicated to helping to improve the sustainability and um, help support the adoption of open infrastructure for research and for scholarship. Um, this is a really important conversation. We've been having a series of these over the past few months, following some work that we've done over the past 18 months uh, around the future of open scholarship and what that means for infrastructure, um, and specifically the systems and the tools and the protocols that we rely on, as well as the ways in which that that impacts the communities in which they serve. Um, this conversation is the third in that series, and um, we've got an amazing lineup of speakers. Um, just to give a little bit of a framing as to where this conversation has sort of um, come from. For the last, uh, I would say at least six months, we've had conversations around when it comes to um, making decisions about the infrastructure and the systems that we put forward and what accountability might look like and the role of community, um, thinking about where we can draw from examples outside of the research and scholarly communication spheres and even outside of higher education. And many of the examples that you'll hear from today are looking at similar ways in which underlying technology and, and systems around data and privacy and who gets to make those decisions and where there needs to be additional scrutiny, um, how that has played out in adjacent sectors and also within higher education itself. Um, this is a really fundamental aspect of our work and especially following some recent announcements that I'll drop in the chat um, with some investments that IOI has recently gotten. We'll be thinking more deeply about these issues moving forward. Um, and so looking to have this be a way to help catalyze that conversation and thinking and hopefully broader participation as we move into the coming months. Uh, with that, I want to introduce our moderator, uh, Vanessa Reinsmith, the Executive Director of the Center for Critical Internet Inquiry at UCLA. Um, many of you may have um, recognized Vanessa from some work that she did with us on the Future Open Scholarship Project. She'll be leading today's um, conversation and introducing the rest of our speakers. So Vanessa, over to you. Hello. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces and some new faces. Um, thank you so much, Caitlin. I'm going to try to keep um, this part as, 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 as concise as possible, um, given that we've got an awesome topic, which is kind of why I have this like permagrin between the people and the, the topic. Um, again, just thank you to Caitlin for, you know, creating space both for the conversation and, and, um, and just all the work that she does um, in terms of IOI. Um, I also, um, want to acknowledge the unceded land for which I sit. I am here in Massachusetts um, and um, and I, um, I'm on the land of the Wampanoag people. Um, I also wanna take a moment to um, acknowledge that even though we're the coming to the close on Pride Month as the mom of a non-binary uh, 11 year old, it is pride all day, every day um, and to continue to sort of you know support and care um, for one another uh, in these uh, unique times, um, shall I say. Um, so with um, that, um, as Caitlin mentioned, for, for kind of the impetus for this conversation came out of the, the Freedom of Open Scholarship work where um, I've gotten to know um, a good handful of you sort of through that participatory process. Uh, one of the outcomes in terms of talking about the future of open scholarship was the idea of tech oversight um, and and what role could or should that play uh, in the the open uh, infrastructure, open scholarship, open research spaces? Um, in uh, as we started to sort of explore that question, um, we found ourselves, you know, recently with the Clarivet um, acquisition. Um, and, and as somebody um, myself, who's in sort of more of the peripheral spaces and communities, it was starting to feel very similar to other things that we have seen, uh, whether it's, you know, the, the, the endless acquisitions that Facebook uh, has or Google, um, thinking about these in terms of the consequences and impacts on the communities in which we're serving. Um, so the, 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 the point of this conversation really is to, to do a couple things, which is to bring together a group of people who are 
uh, passionate experts in their own sort of right and, and bringing individuals together to sort of weave a thread of what does um, data justice and scholarship and open knowledge um, and accountability and transparency look like um, from a variety of angles in terms of thinking about how do we move forward. Um, and at the conclusion, kind of like the little like peek at the conclusion um, is that we're gonna talk a little bit more towards the end around what specifically um, IOI is going to be doing around tech oversight and opportunities for folks to get involved. Um, and I will be involved in sort of in that leading that work um, and so excited to talk about that more. So with that, I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna hand it over to our, our speakers to, uh, they're gonna introduce themselves, talk a bit about who they are and the roles that they play within their organization or within their specific sectors. Um, and, uh, and then we'll dig into the meat of the conversation. So uh, with that, I'm gonna start with Gabrielle and hand it over to you. Hi everyone, my name is Gabrielle Rejvi. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior policy manager at Color of Change. Um, I lead our federal advocacy on tech policy and antitrust. And Color of, Color of Change is the nation's largest online racial justice organization powered by over 7 million members. We operate at the intersection of tech policy and racial equity. Um, I come to tech policy with a background and an interest in civil rights and labor rights. Um, and that provides uh, a different approach to tech policy and antitrust to some of our colleagues, uh, especially in the Beltway. Um, or the, the, the Washington um, metro area. Um, and so we uh, treat antitrust and tech policy as indispensable tools to advancing racial justice. Um, and that lens is crucial to ensure that tech policy decisions don't leave uh, black communities behind. And I'll pass it back to you, Vanessa. All right, moving through. Thank you, Gabrielle. Moving through the list, we've got, so D, you're next. Hi all, um, yeah, so great to be here. Um, I feel like my career um, has been sort of more of like a wavy line or like many branches. <laughs> um, I actually, um, I, I started out um, as an analyst and really like heavily focused on data. I used to work at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and their fair lending department um, on doing audits of banks essentially to ensure that they were they were distributing loans in equitable ways um, across races, across ages, across genders. Um, and I think that that experience led me to go to policy school. Um, and then afterwards, um, I've really I've sort of been in two distinct spaces. I've I prior to my current role, I was the director of um, the Columbia IBM Center for Blockchain and Data Transparency, where I was really helping um, helping push forward research at Columbia University um, on, on data transparency techniques um, and also how the blockchain can facilitate that. And right now I am a consultant at CARP Strategies um, and really focused on um, community engagement um, in communities where economic development projects are, are happening. Um, and really creating um, an equitable lens and focus um, to, um, to that kind of work. Thank you, welcome Dee. Uh, Sarah, I'm gonna pass it to you and then Shay, you're gonna round us out. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Lambden and I'm a law professor at um, City University New York School of Law, so CUNY. Um, and I actually teach administrative law and information law. So um, Deepra, I'm super excited that you were at uh, CFPB. That's one of my favorite agencies. I talk about it a lot in class. Um, so in addition to just being kind of a run of the mill law professor that teaches legal doctrine, I also am a librarian um, and I have been a librarian for far longer than I've been a law professor. And um, I, used to work, I was the research analyst in some big law firms. I helped um, start Bloomberg Law, which is like a legal research product. Uh, so I've gotten to see kind of legal publishing, both as a consumer and as a, like kind of a builder. And um, I have most recently, so besides administrative law, my area of law that I like research and think about a lot is, I call it information law. It's 
So kind of that spectrum between transparency loss, so government acts, you know, access to information like, you know, court cases and, and government materials. And then on the other end, data privacy, right? So the, the idea that there is some information that we shouldn't have access to and that should be our personal and private. So, so legally, that's kind of the spectrum I work in. And um, in 2017, I noticed that research products were the same products that were selling our private data to um, government data brokers. And that really alarmed me. And I went to the, I went to the product, um, I went to the companies and I said, hey, this seems like a problem. And I like was so naive. I was like, oh, they're going to fix it. Or they're going to explain to me why this is normal and okay. And um, what happened was the opposite. And the more I dug and pushed against the companies, the bigger I realized the problem was kind of going to what Vanessa was saying, like these companies that just acquire other companies and kind of do these, you know, they act with impunity because there are no legal restrictions on them. So I became kind of fixated on that. And now I'm actually writing a book called Data Cartels about these companies um, and the impacts that they have on like the same people that Gabrielle is working to make sure are included in tech policy um, and kind of how they're working against kind of the the access to information world that we envision for ourselves. Sarah, your book sounds amazing. I cannot wait to read it. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shay Swagger, pronouns he and his. I am an academic librarian at the Auraria Library. Uh, I am also a PhD student in education and critical studies at CU Denver. I think a lot, write a lot about uh, surveillance and privacy, uh, but, but more specifically, uh, carceral technologies. And by that, I mean prisons and policing. I'm, a, I'm an abolitionist, which means that I'm trying to apply principles of abolition to conversations about technology and privacy and surveillance. And I think uh, I'll probably do that a little bit here in this conversation, but in general, I think that's been a really helpful framework for me to understand what's happening with technology and data and information. And I think it provides a really interesting and, and productive way forward about what to do next. So I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Welcome, wonderful. I wish there, I was just, I couldn't help but like laugh. I was thinking like, could you just imagine if we could have just gone to Facebook and be like, hmm, looks like, like, you know, like this thing might be a problem. Like our lives would be so much easier. But um, but I think but that is, again, what I love about that is like it showcases exactly why we're having this conversation. And, and in terms of, you know, we see in the media or we hear through the work that we do, you know, the much larger companies, the much larger issue, like this under the much larger umbrella of big tech, but but also like this is impacting, in, this is happening in all kinds of corners. So, um, uh, I think that's it's a great sort of connection. Um, so to get us started, um, and I and I always like to make sure not to assume sort of where everybody is coming from from a from a knowledge perspective. Um, I I have asked um, if if D specifically if you can sort of start us off um, talking a little bit more about algorithms and inequality. Um, and and sort of in that specifically sort of what is an algorithm for the, the, the um, but then also the the piece in terms of set, why it's important to center these conversations of algorithms um, around equity and and specifically also because um, I've had the pleasure of knowing this project the automating NYC project that you worked on when you were a Kennedy School student sort of also talking about sort of within that lens because it's such a great example on the work that you guys really did in terms of New York City. Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, I should have uh, mentioned that in my intro, but um, my my kind of graduate capstone thesis was a project called Automating.NYC. Um, you can check it out. It's just out of, it's literally Automating.NYC. You can um, you can you can put that in your search bar. Um, but the project was really on kind of documenting algorithms that are used in New York City government um, and kind of demystifying um, demystifying those concepts. So what it, what is an algorithm? What are the algorithms that are used? Outlining a few case studies and then really developing um, a framework for how we think about um, how a public system should use algorithms. So what is what is an ethical use of algorithms? Um, 
which is something I think it should be central to how a government thinks about implementing algorithms. And um, kind of unfortunately, what we found is like, that's not how New York City government thinks about algorithms now. Um, and um, sorry, let me take let me take a brief step, step back. Um, Vanessa, you asked me to define an algorithm. I would define it um, as a any sort of mathematical model um, that helps you make decisions. So, and that can be um, kind of on various scales. So, I, you know, it can kind of spit out an analysis that you know that you then take and consider yourself, or it can like tell you exactly what decision to make. So, that's kind of part of the importance of algorithms is how how complex they are because that both impacts how much. Um, how much decision making you know the algorithm is actually doing, um, as well as you know how easy it is for us um, to understand what it's doing, because um, there are definitely algorithms out there that we don't understand, and um, I think a lot of the um, there a lot of the there are a lot of the ethical implications around that are. Um, very centered on transparency. I think are we we've we've come up with like a pretty um, a somewhat comprehensive framework on how we should be thinking about these algorithms. There are like tiers of like transparency and um, like how strong an algorithm is. But I think really the main takeaway and like the central thesis of our work is that algorithms must have a good purpose um, and in that that purpose like ha has to be equity and justice driven. So a, a government's purpose is to serve its people. And so any algorithm that's implemented and used by government um, has to make life better for people, has to make the world a better place. Um, it cannot um, it cannot be a good perfect purpose, if it's simply making systems more efficient, it's simply doing things faster than how things are already done in the current world. Because what we, we believe is that um, our current systems are very unjust. Our current systems perpetuate racial inequality and implementing um, an algorithm into any of these systems um, without, con without understanding that we live in an unjust world is simply going to make those injustices, uh, you know, as occur faster and become bigger, uh, and and thus, like that's why you really need kind of that centering print, centering like readjustment um, of purpose to be like, oh, when we implement algorithms um, into our systems, we really have to think about, um, we really have to think about what the what our current you know system looks like what our current governance models look like who they're serving and how how can we implement an algorithm to change those things or at the very least take them into account so that we do not worsen um worsen situations um and especially worsen outcomes for the most vulnerable populations um uh, in in our communities um but yeah, <laughs> any other questions on that, Vanessa? <laughs> I was like, yeah, we've got plenty to unpack there in terms of the, the systems, the systems of oppression. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna save that for the rest of our group because actually, of course, you teed it up beautifully, which I, I suspected you might in terms of sort of these continuing threads of like sort of the, the tensions of efficiency, um, the tensions in terms of uh, the existing systems and what those existing systems represent. Um, and I think you asked a really important question in terms of like who who is who is it that that is being um, um, served? And I think that that's a nice tie-in actually to sort of the question that I specifically wanted to ask Sarah. Um, in terms of, you know, as sort of Dee alluded to, we can't talk about algorithms without talking about data. I feel like, um, and and uh, and given your your book and your that you're you're currently in the midst of working on, uh, talking a bit, if you could talk a little bit about sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, and 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 um, 
and and specifically kind of talking about the complex relationship um you know in this case librarians or or you know i think anybody who's sort of in information spaces um have to data um especially as you sort of noted in in your piece on um the use of data in surveillance technologies and and that sort of that really like light thread to to chat about super light it's it's a romp um no. <laughs> so yeah i think to follow on um kind of the algorithmic overview that the deepra gave so well and um automating nyc which is awesome i think you can see like in that in in deepra's project how um how algorithms can be used for you know good things but they can also be used really harmfully and there are biases built in like they automate systems of bias that are already you know unfortunately rampant in government decision making right so i think of data as algorithm fuel <laughs> like data is the blood that goes through the circulation system of all of our predictive software all of our decision making software none of that none no algorithms no machine learning um no ai none of that would work without just a steady stream of data right there needs to be crunchable material flowing through all the time and so i really focus on that material um part of that is because i'm so not a tech expert and i so don't i'm so not an algorithm expert but i am an information expert as a library person right and as somebody who's who's worked in in building library systems and organizing data so um i think from the perspective so to kind of take the understanding of like what the algorithm what the algorithmic problems are and then to link it back to things like Clarivate acquiring ProQuest and kind of all of our publishers that used to be very, I, used, I always call them like mom and pop publishers. They used to be just little publishers that would publish discrete things, right? Like your science journal would be published in maybe an academic institution and then you would buy it from their press. Um, and if you wanted to buy a magazine, maybe you go and you purchase it or you go to a library and you'd, you know, pull it out of the stacks and you'd look at it. And all of these different bits of, of information and these sources for information would come from different places. So with digitiza digitization, we got like the wonder of being able to access anything anywhere, right? Like you could go on eBay and find like a decorative candle that you collect from, you know, a completely different state and, and have it immediately, right? So the, the internet and digitization is wonderful, but also it led to the consolidation of our information resources and kind of taking them out of our hands and out of our ownership and putting them in the hands of these gigantic companies that have huge copyright portfolios, right? They don't just own one journal, they own thousands of journals and over you know since the 90s these these few entities have been consolidating more and more and more and what we're left with is like two or three huge data holders and i call them the data cartel like that's kind of the focus of my 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 whole premise um and i really focus on reed elsevier lexis nexus and thomson reuters but now proquest clarivate gives us a whole new third company to 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 start poking at so these companies are interesting because they don't just own information that we want to access like court cases or science journals they also own tons of our personal data um and they are the government's biggest data brokers so they sell not just information that we want to access they also sell our private information that we don't want anyone to see and they sell it to the government so they sell it to police and they sell it to the the um the agency that's making decisions about SNAP benefits or child custody, right? So we have just a few companies vertically integrating like all of our the world's information, both information that we need access to in order to make decisions about our health, our legal standing, whether we're doing something illegal, right? We need to be able to access legal information and scientific information and financial information as consumers to be able to make good choices. But they also own information that nobody should be able to access. Um, so they have they have some of the most robust personal data da dossiers of us than anyone in the world. LexisNexis knows more about you than you know about yourself. Okay, the data the data they have about you captured in your Lex ID is more powerful than like your social security number or your email password or whatever your most secret you know um, identifier is. 
So these companies have a lot of power over our information, right? When we think about informational capitalism, like these are the informational monopolists. They are at the like, they're at the, the top of the information and data mountain. So they're fueling all of our algorithms. Um, and so I'm a lawyer, right? And you know, like how they always say like to a hammer, everything's a nail. Um, to, to me, everything is a law and policy problem, which means I can't wait to hear what Gabriel, or Gabriel has to say about all of this because I have had a really hard time identifying a good legal solution for the problem of consolidated data ownership. Like um, I think the, the Facebook decision from yesterday um, where, the, um, where the federal court system said that, um, that Facebook was not violating antitrust law. Um, to me, that just like shows that antitrust in its current form, antitrust law is not a good vehicle for solving kind of digital uh, monopolization problems. Obviously copyright isn't, copyright just gives these companies more powerful power. So intellectual property is not really a, a good legal solution in its current form. Neither is constitutional law because there are all these loopholes built into like the fourth amendment and the first amendment that lets these companies do things that don't feel very constitutional, right? They don't feel like they're valuing our privacy or our freedom of speech. Um, and yet the companies are allowed to do all of this stuff. So um, I'm really interested to, to hear what people think about, you know, potential solutions for, for kind of these huge data cartels and this, this data monopolization problem. Um, oh, and I didn't, yeah. So the particular one, the one last thing I would mention is the reason I became fixated on this is because in 2017, I learned that RELX, Reed Elsevier, Lexus, Nexus, and Thomson Reuters we're selling, they have multi-million dollar contracts with law enforcement agencies across the country and with ICE, so Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And they're selling all of our data to the biggest government surveillance programs in the country um, and the kind that are doing a lot of that biased policing decision-making. So they're data partners with Palantir um, and they are basically just giving, they're using our data in ways that we probably don't want them to be using our data. Um, so it's it's really a pressing problem. Um, and I think this is actually perfect for Shay because I think shit, like I would to hand, hand the baton off to Shay at this point. <laughs> I love I love how that works. So I am thinking like in my brain, I'm like, oh, I see a future conversation on LexisNexis and the FTC. I mean, it, and, you know, and thinking that we now have like the ultimate antitrust champion in terms of uh, chairwoman, uh, Lena Khan. So, you know, just things to pin for a future but again, why, you know, bringing all the pieces together? Because again, I think about the things that I know the areas, even the people in which I'm focused on, you know, has not necessarily been in that direction. And again, you know, I think any opportunity to be able to show like accountability is real, which we're going to talk about in a second, I think is important because yes, I think with everything else happening, it's gotten a whole lot harder. Um, I, so also tying your piece um, and, and yes, and tagging it over to Shay, I, I also want to bring it back to, I think what's really interesting is again, especially in terms of efficiency, I think we, you know, we see often the the example of building something that is to, to enable efficiency. And I think, you know, what was so again sort of poignant in terms of what, you know, D, and I think also what what you're saying, Sarah, in terms of like the consequences of like what are the consequences of building things for for purely efficient like oriented reasons for purely system, you know, to improve a system and, and, and the consequences of that. And I think that that to me is a really nice link into um, Shay, you know, specifically kind of the work that you're looking at and thinking about like, you know, I want to think about also like what happens when this is happening in public spaces, what's, you know, when it's happening in terms of like ethics of care, um, Shay, you had that great MIT tech review piece in terms of talking about proctor proctoring exam tools. So specifically, because I think also for anybody who is coming off of a year of virtual remote school with any of their children too, because is and you know that was like an eye opener uh, in and of itself. But I think we've seen, you know, how do we toe this line between being helpful um, and being a and being oppressive and perpetuating sort of systems of oppression? Um, and again, kind of the biggest question is like, what is our role as stewards? of knowledge and the community um, to ensure both like ach achievement um, um, in an increasingly like tool centered society. 
Yeah, that's a lot. Um, we'll get to some of that. Okay, so whether or not you know what proctoring is, that's it doesn't matter because I think automated test proctoring is a really interesting microcosm of what's happening in, in a macro sense. So very briefly, remote test proctoring is when students will take a test online and uh, probably half a dozen different companies are in the space that are the major players. And they have a proprietary software that will turn on your camera and record you um, and record a lot of what you do in this space. And it uses a combination of machine learning and artificial intelligence and biometric identifiers to tell you if you're cheating, to tell your teacher if you're cheating. Um, it's trash. It doesn't work. It's total bullshit. It's, it's not a helpful, real tool. However, it's a very profitable industry. Um, so there's here's the tie into the larger ecosystem here. Technology in general tends to be an amplifier of existing social conditions. And in this case, those social conditions are white supremacy, ableism, sexism, transphobia, all those sort of structural pre-existing oppressive systems. And then remote proctoring software like almost every technology then sort of reifies and amplifies those systems and it encodes them and, and it presents them to both teachers and students and society as objective and neutral and just math but it also doesn't allow any sort of accountability or oversight a lot of this conversation is about oversight is you know all right i sense that there's this racist outcome in student suspicion scores which there is but companies will, will say, we're definitely not racist. We're super not racist. We're the most not racist. Um, and then you're like, show me your code. And they're like, hell no. And so there's, um, they, they use intellectual property as sort of this you know, stone wall to uh, say, no, you can't uh, see what we're doing because then our competitors would have an advantage. Uh, and so they can get away with it. Um, I have seen a little bit of development in this space. You know, um, a bunch of senators wrote a letter of concern to all the companies saying, you know, hey, we're, we're here and some things are going on with your products. Uh, let us know what's going on. And the companies are like, listen, it's cool. We're fine. Go away. And it hasn't really progressed since that. And so here's where I would say uh, oversight and accountability stops and abolition begins. I don't think that every technology is reformable. I don't think every institution is reformable. That's part of being an abolitionist is, is sort of, you can draw some lines around, this is a social function that can be helpful. It, it might like suck in some ways, let's improve it, let's make it better, let's invest and take time and community resources. And then we can say, here are certain social systems or technologies that are actually inherently harmful that it doesn't matter how much we tweak or we try to reform, ultimately we need to abolish it. And so I think that remote test proctoring is a category of technology that is inherently not reformable and no amount of oversight, no amount of accountability can make that better. And so I say we abolish it, we ban it. We actually, you know, we can make laws to do that. I don't think that's as effective as community organizing and canceling contracts and, and pressuring and protesting. Um, there has been some effective uh, protests, usually by students at their higher ed institutions, uh, brought through student government where institutions have said, all right, we're gonna cancel our contracts. Um, and it was because students citing equity concerns and privacy concerns um, saying that this is a violation and we won't stand for this. And so they, they backed down. Um, if they had tried a policy route, which I have tried at my own institution and been very unsuccessful, um, I, I don't think you'd get as far. Um, and so I think a more protest abolition uh, route in this case can be more successful. Um, I, I also just want to comment on a couple other things that uh, are in the remote test proctoring conversation that apply to tech in general. Um, if you're familiar with the term called technological solutionism, sort of this belief that technology is benevolent and inherently magical, that it can solve um, 
really complex problems that people have been, you know, trying to figure out for a long time. And you're like, you know, actually, I think a couple of 22 year olds from Silicon Valley, that's, those are the guys that are going to fix it. Like, no, that's, I, I call bullshit on that too. Technological solution is not something that can actually um, address what test proctoring is trying to do. Uh, another feature I, I find is outsourcing sort of core functions of whatever the technology is supposed to solve. So not education, this is supposed to be assessment, like tests are supposed to sort of assess learning in some meaningful way. And I also reject the premise that tests are good assessments of learning. That's another conversation. But higher education then said, not only are we not going to do it, we're going to pay a software company to take over a, a core feature of what education is supposed to be about. And you'll see that in government. You'll see that in nonprofits, uh, where we take core functions of what is supposed to be a public service, and then we privatize it, and we can modify it. Um, it's almost always a bad outcome. Not always, but almost always. Um, and then I also see a, a trend of neoliberalism, sort of this idea that the individual is responsible for uh, structural issues. So in the case of, of test proctoring, it goes down to the student has to conform to a really broken system rather than saying, let's reject the premise of the system that made it impossible for that student to succeed in the first place. So all of those reasons are why I think abolition, not only just of the police and ICE and, and prisons and jails, yes, all of those things, but anything that is like tied up in carceral logic. And uh, I would point you to uh, a really good blog post. I think it's um, it's about cop shit by Jeffrey Morrow. I don't know if anyone can throw the link in there, but it sort of defines what is carceral logic. What is this idea that uh, surveillance and privatization and punishment are going to be the right way to address uh, things like education or, or other things? Thank you so much. Um, and then we can say that anything that sort of is important carceral logic, whether or not you're uh, police or prison, um, we can effectively say, no, we reject the premise of your argument and we're not going to engage with you. We're not going to give you our money. And if need be, we will protest or you know pass laws to, to ban that kind of function. I don't know if that was everything you wanted me to talk about, but um, I want to make sure there's more time for uh, definitely Gabrielle. It was, it was like the perfect cue up actually, and especially in terms of like levers for change um, and, and what and how do we put pressure uh, to, to nudge the, the change that we want. And that, that is exactly why I have Gabrielle here because I think for, you know, for many years, I've been a very big fan in terms of the, the policy and advocacy work that Color of Change does, uh, especially also in sort of this current climate. Um, you know, if Gabrielle, I love it if you could talk a bit about like, you know, we've talked to like the crucial role that like advocacy and policy making plays in this, all this oversight, um, putting uh, in terms of consumer and community protection, um, but also specifically to like the act of, or, you know, community organizing, coalition building. Um, I know uh, again, something that we're, I know many of us are involved in, but I think it's, it's really important in terms of like, you know, where we can hit a law, where we can hit, you know, pull advocacy in, where we can um, put different pressures pieces on. And I'll sort of say like, if you want to sprinkle anything around the current antitrust situation, I'll say feel free, given that I know that is your area. And, but also like, it's so timely and relevant, increasingly so. Um, so I'll just, and, and I guess the last thing I'll say is for folks too, if, um, if you want, if you have questions, please feel free to add those to the chat and we'll do our best to try to get to some of those too before we wind down as well, so. Yeah, and I love that everybody raised different forms of advocacy. Um, so you have like grassroots organizing, um, you have uh, corporate accountability going straight to the company. Um, I do a lot more government advocacy. So thinking about how can we um, communicate what folks on the ground are asking for to Congress um, and to federal agencies and also to the executive branch and thinking of how can we make some of uh, the protections that our communities are asking for and our community need, um, how can we secure that in a collective manner? Um, a lot like this is not to discount other forms of advocacy, 
Um, obviously, if you can win a court case, that's awesome for you. Sometimes that doesn't lead to community wins. Um, and so thinking about how to uh, bring about the, the, the most effective amount of change. Um, and so um, really quickly uh, on the antitrust front, front um, there are tech companies that have really large market power um, and they use that to insulate themselves from corporate accountability. Um, Color of Change was part of a coalition uh, that led the Stop Hate for Profit ad boycott last year, um, one of the largest ad boycotts on Facebook. And um, Mark Zuckerberg could tell investors not to worry about it, um, although millions of dollars were being withheld because um, Facebook is part of an ad duopoly. So you either are going to advertise online with Facebook or Google. Um, and there are some companies that have continued their boycott and are no longer um, advertising with Facebook. But a lot of the companies um, had to return because that was the only way that they can reach consumers. Um, and so because of that, because of learning that about or like realizing that as we were doing reflections on the campaign, we realized that we need to put more effort and more um, power behind antitrust. Um, and like Sarah said, the current laws are not designed in a way or interpreted in a way, um, interpreted by judges in a way that would allow for more equitable market structures. And so there is a need for new antitrust laws that address the realities that we're facing. Um, and when we see that corporate accountability is failing, that's when we need the federal government to step in. Um, and so it's vital that regulators have the funds that are necessary as well as the staff. So in addition to having um, just numbers of uh, employees, also making sure that they have the expertise so that way they can look at an algorithm and understand whether or not Facebook is um, trying to pull the wool over their eyes, um, but also having expertise in civil rights and racial equity. So that way they can look at an algorithm and acknowledge that, okay, you're not asking for race, but you're asking for zip code, which is a pretty um, basic proxy for race. And so thinking about how to make sure that these algorithms that are being, in, that are being used are being evaluated on that level and making sure that it's not only the companies that are doing this. Um, we look at Google, uh, which fired, who fired um, Dr. Tim Gebru uh, for raising issues with um, natural learning process, uh, processing models and the ways that um, there are climate change concerns and climate change will disproportionately impact low-income communities and communities of color. Um, and we saw Google say like, there are benefits, <laughs> so let's not worry about that. Um, it's a clear, that's like the, the example that we always turn to to point out that self-regulation is a model that's failing and we need government to, the government to step in and to, to make some changes. Um, I, uh, we're really excited about Senator Markey and Representative Matsui's Algorithmic Justice and Online Platform Transparency Act. Um, it's a very targeted algorithmic accountability bill, but we're super excited to see um, more bills like it. Um, so the bill calls on social media companies to evaluate the algorithms they use. And my favorite part is that it prohibits the use of algorithms that are found to discriminate. So we don't only want transparency, we don't only want um, audits of these algorithms. We also want to make sure that algorithms that are found to harm historically marginalized communities, that they're no longer being used. Um, uh, and I um, also love that Sarah raised that data is the fuel to algorithms. Um, because we see that if or we're advocating that you cannot have a data privacy bill without also addressing algorithms. Um, we see with Facebook, um, it's a very old example, but uh, they were allowing advertisers to target folks um, in affinity racial groups. So um, the data that Facebook was collecting, they were able to feed it to an algorithm and uh, pretty successfully predict um, what racial group you were a part of. And so even if we tell Facebook that they can no longer have cookies that co uh, track us across the internet, um, the, the activity that you do on the Facebook app, um, they can collect that data as a course of business, which is often um, a exception that we see in, in privacy bills, um, making sure that we are cutting off all of these instances where discrimination can um, come on board. Um, and so really want to highlight the fact that coalitions are key to all of the changes that we're seeing in Congress. Um, it's really hard for one organization to move Congress in a direction. And so making sure that all the relevant stakeholders are involved in the conversation as well to raise issues um, that 
uh, or issues and blind spots that uh, an organization might not see. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Vanessa. Thank you. And I love that you mentioned Timnit. I have she's in Wired. Everybody should get the current Wired. There's so many great, um, she's lovely and there's there's some great pieces. Um, and we will, we have the joy of getting to work with her at the center, but you will be, she will be popping up and she will continue to lend her expertise and power to these spaces as well. Um, so as we start to get kind of like to the, the end, like as I said, I was like, oh my God, I, we could, let's just add three more hours, guys. Um, we won't really, because who's got that right now? But, um, you know, I think the, the, my most like, succinct question to all of you is, you know, and again, as we sort of said that, you know, there is a need for transparency, there's a need for oversight, there's, there's a um, need for accountability, there's um, so many different ways to, to, to do that, um, coalition building being, you know, one of many, grassroots organizing, protests, policy. Um, we've also seen uh, many folks who have you know, we've seen tech, we could still just use the bad example, use Facebook's tech oversight get set up. You know, we've seen these things get stood up. Um, we have seen many of them be criticized. Um, my question to you all uh, in sort of like in, in two minutes or three minutes or less um, is, is, what is what is one way that we could do oversight like within like the power that we like have, or, or the type of folks who are on this call like we have individually that where it could work well like if we if we had no if no limits what what is one thing that we could or should be doing to start to to call for that or executing that she's like burn it all down all of it no <laughs> Oh, here, and I'll, I'll add, because then we'll just add to this, because then this will make people will help the conduct. So, for example, as I sort of queued up in the beginning of this, one of the things, for example, and, and this was, is I will be responsible for with IOI, working with Caitlin, is, is how can we set up some type of, you know, tech oversight might not even be the right word. Coalition has been far more of interest, because I, I do believe it is about coalition building and community, to be able to um, help uh, uh, draw either attention or pressure or support, you know, in situations that are as big as Clarivet or, or smaller in terms of you know, some something that one may, you know, one academic library, like, how do we like, if I literally, I'm going to be trying to do that. What's the one thing you would say, like, do this, or, you know, so you don't basically F it up. If that helps, we'll get like, make it real tangible. So I'm just going to jump in because I do have to hop off in a few minutes. Um, this has been so lovely. Thank you for having me, Vanessa. Um, and yes, I think about this like all the time and I feel like I have different answers on different days and um, this isn't a complete answer. But one thing I think about is um, like, so I used to work at Columbia and like we, we would, I, I would work with a lot of people who were um, kind of like on the medical side of things, especially with like COVID happening. We were working on a lot of like data transparency plus COVID projects. Um, and they would bring up the IRB like all the time. Like, oh, is this like, would this pass like IRB approval? Like we have to consider this. These are the guidelines. And it was interesting to me because I was like, wow, there's like no parallel for tech. Like we never think about how like the IRB exists because like there used to be, you know, doctors and scientists who would perform atrocious experiments on people and especially groups uh, of especially very vulnerable people. Um, and we really don't have the same on the data side. We are just like, we're kind of in the wild west right now where there's tech is being, you know, tech is being rolled out, algorithms are being used, governments are using them. They have no idea how they work. Um, and we have like no kind of guiding principle or kind of centralized like this is the purpose of why we do this and like this is our like set like we use you know we use tech we analyze data we implement algorithms to make the you know 
to make the world a more equitable and just place. Like nothing like that exists. Um, and and I feel like, you know, even even without having like um, kind of a legal framework behind it or it being like an explicit law, like um, kind of different groups, coalitions of people coming together, civil society organizations, government, um, hopefully some type companies um, coming together to create something like that, I feel like would be a, a really interesting um, first step. Thank you so much. And thank, I know you've got to jump, but thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have anything they want to add or Shay? All right, so yes, burn lots of things down, that's fine. Um, and I think a lot of conversations when it comes to, you know, trying to do an abolitionist framework or approach to anything, that is the initial reaction of that's what abolition is, is just not this. I will say that not this, not Facebook, not Google, that's a, that should be enough, that's a lot. But I would say one of the most helpful things that we can do is working on imagining what we want instead. So uh, there's a, a guy, civil rights activist, DeRay McKesson. He wrote a book called The Other Side of Freedom. And he talks extensively about the role of imagination. That we are trying to build a world that we have never seen. So I think that when we say, you know, what do we want when it comes to accountability or oversight or, you know, data privacy, those are, those are good questions. But I would submit that maybe we should start asking is what is the world we would want to live in? And I think that they, this is where intersectional feminist ethics of care can be a really helpful way to think around what is the world that I want to live in? Like, I want to feel loved. I want to feel safe. I want to feel connected. And what do I need in order to, to have those things? What kind of world when it comes to education or government or business or whatever it is that in the scope of what we're talking about, I need to imagine that world and have something to build towards so I can address the immediate, what do I need to do right now to get there? And yes, that might include some of the steps that we've talked about today, but if, unless I have that imagined future, I get really lost. And so if, if you could just take some time, everyone on this call, to imagine what is the world that you want to live in, that will really help motivate the kinds of questions of what do we do now in a practical sense. I love it. And you're bringing in the intersectional feminist ethics of care, which I have too many monitors that I can't open things, but there are, I, I will, I have a couple papers. I mean, I, you know, the, the beauty of getting to work with Dr. Sophia Noble, I, like very much true in terms of the, the, the idea of future, you know, futuring. Um, uh, is so, so crucial and so important. Um, and I guess I want to be super mindful of time because it said I, I alone selfishly have so many questions. So, so one, I want to acknowledge that there are questions in the chat that we have not even gotten to get to because, you know, we've got, we've just had such a rich conversation already. We'll do our best to try to get answers to those um, and also get up a blog post along with the video for this. Um, I will say sort of in this space of imagining, um, if you are interested um, in imagining with us what this could look like in terms of the open infrastructure, open scholarship community, um, I am going to, oh, I've got my, I'm going to put up an email address for you to, uh, to email, that kind of seems redundant and makes sense, but, um, oh, what's next? That's, we're already there, but I do like a good cat, so I'm going to always put a cat in to anything that I can, um, to email us at Tech Oversight. Um, this is something that we've had been really um, grateful to have uh, the minds of, uh, of, Rog of Robin uh, and Tina um, on, as well as my colleague Stacy, um, doing some initial thoughts. Um, the intent is that we're gonna really start to, th to think about this. And I, and I love the idea of really imagine what, what is and what should be. Um, and again, not be precious about any anything in terms of what it's called, what it is, um, 
you know, really just trying to think again, getting a group to sort of, if folks are interested in sort of getting to the essence of what the, the future should look like as it pertains to open infrastructure and open scholarship. So um, I'll be involved in that, um, obviously, as well as Caitlin. So please send us an email um, as we start to, you know, I'm going to start to think about that while I'm at the beach, maybe, hopefully. Um, uh, now I've got more books to read, thanks to Shay. Um, I do want to also just take a moment um, just to say a big thank you. I know Dee had to scoot out, but a huge thank you to Sarah, Gabrielle, and Shay. Um, I will probably be following up with all of you about some other ideas in terms of the center and some other spaces that we can play and get involved in. This is the type of stuff that really does fill my bucket. Um, I think there's a lot that needs to be addressed in the world. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, and it's always great to do that in community with people who share, um, you know, sort of those same core missions in terms of like, you know, a better society for everybody and, and addressing the systems that exist and knowing that, you know, if we can also bring in the nerdy librarian piece in terms of making sure people have access to information and we can do the things that need to be done, but doing that in a way that is safe and secure um, and free from um, oppression for, for all. So um, with that, with two minutes to go, um, I'm going to say a huge thank you. Um, I hope that everybody is well. Um, have a wonderful week and weekend. Be kind to each other and um, and just um, a general thank you. Thanks again, Vanessa. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. That was super cool. I was say yes. I was like, our speakers. I was like, okay. I was like, 